Nicolas Cage. The mere mention of the name conjures up memories of many performances, from the lovable baker in Moonstruck to the crazy vampire in Vampire's Kiss. Cage is a movie star. One might say he's one of the few remaining Hollywood stars. He's an actor who elevates the films he's in. He makes great films greater, and he makes even the worst movies at least somewhat watchable. He was the only reason I was able to watch all of Left Behind. I think he was the only reason I watched it in the first place. Man, that movie sucked. He's also the only star I know of that practices what's called nouveau shamanic acting. It sounds kind of insane, like Cage is an ancient shaman summoning up the spirits of his characters into his body. That's kind of what it is. It's about completely opening oneself up to the character so that one doesn't feel like they're faking anything while acting. In his words, Say you're playing a demon biker with an ancient spirit. What power objects could you find that might trick your imagination? Would you find an antique from an ancient pyramid? Maybe a little sarcophagus that's a greenish color and looks like King Tut? Would you sew that into your jacket and know that it's right next to you when the director says, Action. Could you open yourself up to that power? The other acting style that Cage utilizes is Western Kabuki. If you know anything about Kabuki theater, then you know that the performances are heavily stylized and over the top, just like a bunch of Cage's performances. I could be intellectual and say that this style allows Cage to express the emotions of his characters in operatic ways, but really what I would mean by this is that it makes for some really funny scenes. Oh, no, not the beast! Not the beast! And it makes watching an unhinged Cage performance an absolute blast. Look, Nick Cage has had a roller coaster of a career. Just so everyone knows, Cage is not his last name. It's Coppola. Yeah, like Francis Ford Coppola, the guy who directed The Godfather. Nick created the stage name so that he wouldn't gain popularity or work based solely off the namesake. He actually didn't like people thinking of him as a Coppola. Still, a couple of his first movies, Rumblefish and The Cotton Club, were directed by his uncle. It didn't take long from Cage to ascend to the status of star. By the end of the 80s, he had graced the silver screen with memorable performances in Raising Arizona, Moonstruck, Peggy Sue Got Married, Valley Girl, and Vampire's Kiss. Come 1996, he was an Oscar winner. He was a prestigious actor who generally acted in pretty good or great movies, and he had a certain charisma like no one else. But it wouldn't stay that way. Due to his irresponsible spending habits, and possibly people not taking care of his money well, he found himself in massive amounts of debt. So he started taking just about any role that paid. Who was once an actor that worked with the greats, was now the Prince of Redbox. He went from acting in at most three films per year to up to five movies a year, many of which were terrible. It also kind of tanked his reputation. People associated him with bad movies and so just also assumed that he was a bad actor. But recently, his rap has turned around. I think people now understand that he was just working to pay off his debts. But also, Cage has started to have a bit of a renaissance, again acting in critically acclaimed films like Pig and Mandy with Pig going completely against type for him. After all these years of movies like Rage, he's proven to the public that he still has it. But anyone who knows anything knows that he never lost it. And now, this Nick cage if that's what we'll call it, has gone meta with the release of The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. I was able to catch an early screening of the movie and I'll give a short review of it at the end of this video. Before that, I want to talk about some Cage Kino that either I feel like is underappreciated or that just isn't talked about nearly enough on YouTube. I know that when people talk about their favorite performances by the Italian Shaman, they bring up Pig, Face Off, Leaving Las Vegas, Raising Arizona, Con Air, or The Rock. If they're a woman, they talk about Nick Cage and Moonstruck. Those are all good movies, but today, I want to shed some light on some of his other films. Other films that deserve the spotlight just as much, or even more, than these other classics. Number 1. Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans Not only is this a Nick Cage movie, but it's also a Werner Herzog film. Truly a match made in heaven. The film is less story-driven and more about Lieutenant Terrence McDonough, a New Orleans police officer investigating the brutal murder of a family. Terrence is a man with some serious problems. He has chronic back pain and so his doctor prescribes him Vyvanse, but he soon begins taking other drugs, or maybe he was always on an assortment of uppers, downers, and the like. McDonough's behavior becomes more and more erratic as his drug intake increases, it leads to some of the greatest cage scenes ever put to film. He comes out of hiding in a nursing home while shaving his face. He sees iguanas as recurring hallucinations. He rants about his lucky crack pipe. You don't have a lucky crack pipe? He puts a gun to an old lady's head, but I think the scene that stands out the most is this one. Shoot him again. What? 
full. His soul is still dancing. <laughs> It's not just pure craziness, though. Underneath the bombastic performance, Cage finds humanity in the character. He's a man beset by addictions, family problems, and outside pressures, but he still wants to be a carrier of justice. He's a completely corrupt cop and probably not one you'd ever want to deal with, so it's a monumental challenge for an actor to make this character likable or relatable in any way. But Cage does. There's a melancholic spirit that underscores Terrence's whole character. I remember when I saw Herzog speak at a class or Q&A type thing a few years ago. He declared that Cage gave his career best performance in Bad Lieutenant Portocol, New Orleans. And you know what? He might be right. That's one way of looking at it. The other is you get to keep 75% and not go to prison for the rest of your life. <laughs> Number two, Joe. The director of Joe, David Gordon Green, has had a pretty weird career. He went from making naturalistic indie dramas to studio stoner comedies back to indie dramas, and now he's making the Halloween sequels. Joe, which released in 2013, was with Prince Avalanche, part of his low-key Texan drama phase. But if Prince Avalanche is more of a dramedy, then Joe is more of a southern gothic tale. Nick Cage plays as the titular character, an alcoholic ex-con making his way in this world by running a company that clears forests for paper companies, farmers, etc. A teenage boy, Gary, played by Ty Sheridan, moves into town with his abusive alcoholic father and soon begins working for Joe. Joe notices how Gary's dad abuses him and he wants to do something, but he's already entangled in a feud between other men in the small Texas town. He's got the local rednecks wanting to kill him, while the law is breathing down his neck, so he knows that if he stands up for the boy, it might mean sacrificing everything. The film feels like something between Jeff Nichols and Terrence Malick, but with enough edge to make it stand out. Green cast the film with a variety of non-actors and locals, and it shows. Between the way the film is shot and the fact that most of the people on screen aren't actors, the movie just feels real and gritty and raw. Yo, goddamn, we're gonna get rid of you and do something different. Something gonna change the day. Cause tomorrow we ain't gonna have this bullshit. And don't expect any cagisms in here. Cage's performance is subtle, yet intense. We can feel the fire rising in him during the whole movie, but he expertly internalizes it. Cage said in interviews about the movie that Joe's character was the closest to his own persona that any character he has ever played has been. I guess Nick Cage said that Joe was literally him. Number three, Color Out of Space. Adapted from the H.P. Lovecraft short story, yes, the H.P. Lovecraft who had a famous cat, Color Out of Space blends science fiction, psychological horror, and body horror into a darkly entertaining movie. In this highly stylized horror, Nick Cage is the head of a household in the middle of the woods in New York. He and his family farm alpacas and have found happiness in their solitude. But all that comes to an end when a mysterious meteor lands on their property. The meteor brings with it a strange color, a color unlike anything here on Earth. Well, it's easier saying it's a color unlike anything else in a book, but for a film, you've got to work with the colors we know. So it's represented by a mix of purple, magenta, pink, and probably a few other colors. The color changes its surroundings in several ways. First, it messes with the characters' minds, making them say and do things that they would never do, or they imagine other people acting strange. It completely warps their sense of reality. They phase in and out of delusions and hallucinations, becoming dangerous to both themselves and to everyone around them. This is also when Nick Cage is allowed to stop playing his normal dad and start being the Nick Cage we know and love. The color then changes the physical makeup of everything it touches, transforming the film from psychological horror into body horror. Some of the scenes reminded me so much of John Carpenter's The Thing, and I'm here for it. Once the film gets rolling, it's neon-soaked sci-fi horror fun. Don't sleep on this one. Number four, Bringing Out the Dead. Written by Paul Schrader and directed by Martin Scorsese, the duo that brought classics like Taxi Driver and Raging Bull to the big screen, you'd think that Bringing Out the Dead would be a bigger hit. I often see it on lists of the most underrated Scorsese or Cage films. It's a movie that seems to universally be considered underrated, but does that mean it's now regularly rated? The film takes place over the course of one weekend in early 1990s New York City. Cage plays as a paramedic, Frank Pierce, who becomes more and more jaded about the job. He wants to save people, but but lately, no one has been surviving. There's a new drug on the street called Red Death killing people left and right. Not to mention the crime wave and the AIDS epidemic. One death in particular hangs over him, the death of a homeless 18-year-old woman, a death for which he blames himself. He sees her face all over town. She won't stop haunting him. On the flip side, he brings a man back to life at the beginning of the film, knowing full well that the man wanted to die. He saved him, only for the man to continue suffering. As someone who only wants to make the world a better place, 
he realizes that all he's been able to do is create more pain. Due to lack of sleep, increasing hallucinations, and failing mental health, Pierce becomes increasingly unhinged. Scorsese and Schrader section off his different mental states with different partners, played by John Goodman, Ving Rhames, and Tom Sizemore. It progresses from neutral to spiritual, and finally, to utter chaos. The transformation of Pierce in his world is truly something to behold, and the dark, moody cinematography gives the film a great neo-noir feel. Too bad Patricia Arquette is kind of annoying in it. Number 5. Wild at Heart Sex, Crime, and Rock and Roll star in David Lynch's loose remake of The Wizard of Oz. It's got all of Lynch's trademarks, his roster of actors, strange, distorted shots, and a score by Angelo Badalamenti. The film won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival, but it found mixed critical reception upon its release. Don't listen to the critics. It's great. It's also easily Lynch's sexiest movie. Plus, Nick Cage's performance throughout the film is basically an Elvis impression. This is a snakeskin jacket. And for me, it's a symbol of my individuality and my belief in personal freedom. It's a rock and roll road trip with hitmen and hookers that slowly devolves into a southwestern nightmare. It's something that feels like it shouldn't work. Wizard of Oz as a Lynchian road trip, complete with flying witches, but it just works. It's not a film I can or really want to talk about at great length. It's an incredibly emotional movie, and it should just be watched and experienced. So, uh, go watch it. Number 6. Adaptation You know the movie's gonna be a mind-bender when it's written by Charlie Kaufman and directed by Spike Jones. Adaptation is a sort of sequel to Being John Malkovich. It begins on the set of Being John Malkovich, with Nick Cage playing as the film's writer, Charlie Kaufman. He's given a deal to adapt a book called The Orchid Thief, but he finds the task extremely difficult. His anxieties, bad health, and his low self-esteem hinder his creativity as he tries to find a way to adapt the book without it feeling like just another Hollywood movie. The movie then parallels his adaptation of the book with the story of Susan Orlean, played by Meryl Streep, writing the book. Meanwhile, his identical twin brother Donald is working on a script that's basically a parody of Hollywood tentpole cinema. That's right, Nicolas Cage plays the two main characters in this film. Double the cage, double the fun. Unlike a lot of his more well-known films, Cage's performance here is decently understated. He nails down Kaufman really well and this might be his most vulnerable performance next to leaving Las Vegas. It's also interesting to see him play both as a nervous wreck and as an overly confident guy in the same scene. But that's not the most interesting thing about this movie. You see, the plot of the movie is the script that Kaufman writes in the film. It's one of my favorite movies about filmmaking, and the way the script blends reality fiction and an adaptation of the book The Orchid Thief, and then is able to wrap it up in a satisfyingly meta package is just amazing. I also have to give props for this film for its Oscar nominations. Both Donald Kaufman and Charlie Kaufman are credited writers of the film, as they both write the script within the movie. However, Donald Kaufman doesn't exist. So, when Adaptation was nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay, the Academy nominated a fictional person for the award. So go check out those films if you like Nick Cage. You might like them, I personally do, but everyone has different tastes. So, I'd like to know what you think about them. Now, on to the unbearable weight of massive talent. I saw it at an early fan screening last week at the Alamo Draft House. The cinema was filled with Nick Cage fans, and they gave out cutouts of Nick Cage's face to everyone there. Mm, that was a little cringe, but it was fun, so whatever. The movie itself was eh, decently good. It's nothing extraordinary, though. I don't want to spoil the movie too much, but I will say that the best part of the movie by far is the tense bromance between Nick Cage and Pedro Pascal. There are some genuinely great moments between the two of them, but the film is bogged down by its need to turn into a dumb Hollywood action movie. It makes it turning into a blockbuster type film a plot device, which just made me think of adaptation, and I realized that this movie has a lot of parallels with Jones's film, but his film had way more heart. I don't have a big problem with the meta aspect of it, but I don't like how it's mostly used for reference humor to Cage's previous work, but hey, you knew that that was exactly what you're getting into with this movie. The problem is that, unlike adaptation, the film doesn't use its meta nature for any sort of introspection. It's just there to make jokes and reference Cage's movies and his celebrity persona. Honestly, the film feels like an early to mid 2010s R-rated comedy with its aesthetic and sense of humor, which I really didn't care for too much. 
What I did like about the film is how it portrays Nick Cage as a down on his luck actor with alcohol and self esteem problems, while other people refer to him as a legend and see him as someone he's not. He's also a cineast, and it made me happy to hear him talk about classic movies. Plus, it was pretty realistic that his in-movie teenage daughter didn't like the Kino films he was showing her. Is Nick Cage's performance as himself, or at least a version of himself, good? Yeah, of course, even if his character he plays isn't like who he is in real life, but like what Redditors imagine him to be. But you know what is the stuff of nightmares? The de-aged version of Nick Cage that is like the devil on his shoulder. It's supposed to be his younger self that wants him to be a movie star, but man was that de-aging rough. Nick Cage acting against himself, again, something that reminds me of adaptation, is fun. But I think they should have just used Nick Cage at his current age. The CGI on his face took me way out of the film. Overall, if you're a fan of Nick Cage and you want a light, meta, albeit very superficial action comedy, you'll probably enjoy this movie. Is it kind of Reddit? Yeah, but that was obvious. It's still a fun movie that will most likely get a few laughs out of you and entertain you for a couple hours. Still, the films I suggested earlier in the video are better. I'm not gonna give it a numerical score because those are dumb. Instead, I'll end this video with some wise words from the maestro. Do fish have dreams? <laughs> <laughs>